faculty members of IIT Kharagpur are not only engaged in research and teaching in the frontiers of science and technology, but also they put substantial effort in addressing the critical problems that our society is facing today, be it food and water, healthcare, environment, transportation, energy, in many such cases. Myself, Professor Jayantu Mukhopadhyay, Dean of Outreach and Alumni Affairs, is bringing you one of, of my colleagues in front of you in this series of episodes who have excelled in their academics and research and also we have seen that how they have dedicated their, themselves to address such issues by applying their knowledge and findings in solving these problems. Today we have with us Professor Shishendu De of the Department of Chemical Engineering. Shishendu is a internationally renowned expert in membrane separation, in particular nano and microfiltration and fluid transportation in microchannels. He does fundamental research and also applied research. He has developed technologies for water purifications and that's a major contribution uh, we consider. He has developed five technologies, commercialized it. He has also founded a company in this domain. Shishendu obtained various recognitions and awards, including the Shanti Sharu Bhatnagar Prize in 2011. He is an institute chair professor. He is a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, New Delhi, and also he is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, India. So, Shishendu, welcome. Shishendu, thanks for coming to this program. Thank you. So, tell me the story of your transformation from a school kid to become a renowned academician and researcher. Yeah. So, uh, I was born and brought up at Calcutta, a place called Baguati. It is at the outskirts of the city, but now it's in the proper city. Uh, I was, uh, I have done my uh, 10th standard in uh, Vidhanagar Government High School, Salt Lake. And then uh, I, in fact, I came uh, 11th position throughout the uh, Bengal. Then I joined uh, uh, Scottish Church College for 10 plus 2 in 1986. After that, I joined, uh, I got through IIT JE and uh, I joined IIT Kanpur. And uh, that time, I didn't have any idea to which discipline I will join. So my brother was studying at uh, IIT Kharagpur that time in electronics department. So what that, was his name? Uh, his name was Dibben Dude. Okay. So um, uh, he was uh, uh, he he was here from 1984 to 1988. So that time the counselling was used to be done here in, at, at Kharagpur. So we came to Kharagpur and then uh, my brother said, okay, uh, according to your rank, you should join IIT Kanpur. So. He filled the form of everything, so without knowing anything about chemical engineering, I joined chemical engineering department at IIT Kanpur in 1984. And there I have seen that everyone is the topper of the college in, in my batch. So it, it, it must was, be 86, no? 86, 86, 86 to 90. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, there was a very tough competition. And you know, the system of IIT Kanpur undergraduate that day, those days, it was you know, uh, we never came across like that. It means uh, ev every there are so many courses every week. There are assignments of every course, and you have to do and you know things. You know, uh, there are two mid-semester examination, one end-semester examination. Four year passed like anything. It was so fast. In fact, we could not understand much or more of chemical engineering that time. But somehow, uh, at the end of fourth year, I thought I will never be in academics. I'll join an industry. So the the coursework and everything was so hectic, by the, but the faculties were excellent. That time, the, there were you know big shots. They were there in uh, IIT Kanpur, like Professor Sundarajan in chemical in mechanical engineering department, then Professor Y V Rao in chemical engineering department, then uh, Professor Deepak Majumdar in metallurgical engineering department. So they were they were our teachers. Uh, and then uh, at the end of fourth year, I was completely disillusioned about the academics. I decided to join industry. So I started taking the campus uh, interview and uh, 
ultimately i joined gas authority india limited and i was posted in a very remote place it's called guna it is in the rajasthan and madhya pradesh border so i went there and joined and my job was there to fill up the tank you um, know to see the oil level of a pump oh. so <laughs> and i was as maintaining the oil level of the pump for 3 months then uh, i was then after that i was um, asking my senior to give me some technical work so he said you are doing a technical work i said no no i have whatever i am doing my background the educations in uh, any iit is not you know it does not fit to the whatever i'm doing now you give me some technical more technical job so he said right now i you can uh, this is the only thing you can do later on whenever you will be promoted to deputy you know dm position and other things then probably you will be uh, getting into more technical things then i was uh, you know working in gale for uh, first uh, you know six months and i was completely said uh, whatever i was expecting that will be there in the uh, industry. Uh, industry it is not happening so i said i will be never in industry i'll go back to academics okay so then i uh, left industry i resigned uh, the position in the gel i came back home that time and uh, my father expired in, uh, when i was in uh, in 1988 when i was in second year mm-hmm. so my mother was alone there so my brothers were away for their jobs etc so uh, i was staying with my mother and she was very happy then i started uh, taking the uh, you know preparation for the gate examination so six months i took the preparation and in uh, january i took get and uh, i came i qualified um, with the get examination then i immediately i joined iit kanpur mtech for mtech in 1991 because i did uh, one year has passed because of the uh, job in gel in 1991 i uh, joined ma- ma- masters program in uh, iit kanpur again the and same department in the same department chemical engineering department and that time no so i and i had that i i have no option i i industry is not my option now only option is academics and you, you won't believe that all the courses i topped means i got certain you know uplift me i don't know what a hot ever i can i should turn it i started enjoying each and every course like anything and uh, i did pretty well in the uh, examination and uh, i was 10 point at that time in all mtech courses so we used to do around six courses during our mtech that time and uh, we got several publications also in mtech and i was so interested in uh, academics that time and research and everything my whole orientation has, has been changed and uh, that time we didn't have any uh, you know computer access for the papers and there is no scopus uh, you know uh, um, so there so we used to go to the library and look into the hard copies of the journals so i started reading journals many journals like AI, the, you know frontline journals in chemical engineering like aiche chemical engineering science journal of membrane science i started looking into the papers and i was so you know interested i formulated at least six problems that time which will be bringing paper for each pro- solving each problem and i discussed with my uh, 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 supervisor that if i you know look into these problems can i get my phd degree he said why not so, uh, he was very knowledgeable he was a professor pk bhattacharya he was the one of the you know father figure who has uh, you know who introduced membrane science in india that time so he said yes okay so i said sir i would like to do phd i want i don't want to join any other institute i will not waste any more times so from the very first day i will start working so he said okay no problem so i finished my mtech immediately i joined my phd in 1993 and uh, we had i had the goals in front of me these are the six words i am going to do so so each and every problem i started solving and then in 1997 within three and a half year i have submitted my phd uh, then i started looking jobs by that time my mother was pretty sick so i was looking for a job that is close to calcutta so i got got offer from several places like hindustan liver research center at uh, lnt research center bombay but i didn't join so uh, i came here for i i, I applied to iit kharagpur and then uh, i i got i got i was offered for an interview and i came and gave the interview and i was selected and i immediately joined iit kharagpur 1997 so that time i was around 29 and a half right okay so then I, that that was started in 97 then i i you know put myself headlong into the research 
and uh, in, initially there was no not much of you know research funding and uh, i didn't i applied you know left and right for any research funding for various organizations so i started doing theoretical works so i kept on you know publishing and maintain my productivity in first project we got in 2001 that was a uh, project from gas authority india limited and it was a, it was a fantastic project it was a really appli application oriented project and it was like uh, i would like to discuss that no now uh, it was a refinery plant okay so in the refinery it will be it will be getting the it is a it is a petrochemical it is basically downstream of the refinery so in the petrochemical they are producing some kind of polymer and these polymers have different grades based on their properties so, so they are they are producing polyethylene and uh, various grades of polyethylene were there for example there are certain properties of polyethylene for example mel flow index that is connected to viscosity or flowability of the polymer so if this particular component has a value between 0.8 to 0.85 it will be getting grade 1 polymer if this value is from 0.85 to 1 uh you know point 9 then it will be grade 2 from point 9 to point 95 will be grade 3 polymer and each of this polymer will be having a specific marketability in the market so you need to separate them so so you need to have a you know target production that i will be producing grade 2 polymer so that my properties will be confirming that okay okay so how to control that so we did the you know modeling of the full plant the full plant means you know you know pre-heating unit followed by the train of reactors reactors means there were you know four or five reactors in series followed by the separation unit so the whole uh, modeling we have done in in our laboratory computer simulation and then we just you know hooked it up with the dcs system dcs system means all the operating conditions things will be coming on a computer it is called the uh, dcs system and uh, my program will be taking the input from the dcs system and then and then it will execute the program within 2 minute within a, within a one minute and at the end of one minute another set of operating conditions will come by the from the dcs it will take up so, so my this, is, this system is available it's a tool it's, it's a, a software it's a tool. tool i have to i have just, I just had a interface of my program with the dcs system so my program takes the values from the dcs runs it for one within one minute waits there and wait for the next set of dcs and I, what i my program does i my program immediately calculates some properties okay after solving all the equations etc and so i'll be having the online prediction of the properties so if the off spec properties are coming then immediately i take a control action so i have to change the operating temperature or operating process so that the again the properties will come back so that was a very fantastic job and i was so much involved in that and i, I enjoyed it thoroughly after that uh, i started applying in different funding agencies like dst and uh, i would like to i would frankly you know admit that dst has been very you know kind to me so they they kept on giving projects one after another uh, they were not very you know large amount projects small small projects but with that funding i started developing my you know laboratory different equipments so and so forth and uh, the first big funding i got about 1 crores from uh, uh, department of atomic energy and then uh, recently around 5 uh, 3 years back i got a very big funding from uh, water technology initiative there is one uh, group of dst uh, it is uh, that is the water technology initiative group they deal with different water you know treatment technologies and uh, the first uh, project i got in got from them in 2008 so it was removal of the arsenic from the ground water so they kept on giving me three consecutive projects and the, and and then they were you know the whole expert committee of that com uh, of that particular wing is so kind and so so good they they were guiding you at every moment so first phase of you know project it was development of the material this lateritic based material to develop it second is they give a funding for you know pilot scale then in third phase they give another funding for two years which will, you are you can go ahead, go ahead for you know installing a big plant of 2 meter cube per hour capacity that is running for 5 uh, uh, hours producing 10 meter cube or 10000 liter per day distributing throughout the whole village so these three projects are very very successful and after that so that was uh, when this project was completed this project the first phase of the project in 2008 to 2011 then to the, then another two years project up to 2013 then 2015 and uh, by the end of the 2015 i was one of the success stories of wti division of dst so the material was developed the demonstration unit were, were installed they were deployed 
the big plant was installed and commissioned and it was uh, running for six years and then uh, uh, I was hooked up with UNICEF. In fact, Professor P.P. Chakravarti was one of the, he was the Dean R&D that time. He made me connected with, with UNICEF and UNICEF, I did, and I had, I had done a project with UNICEF, two projects in fact, and um, they identified certain, they had a very good uh, interaction and association with public health and engineering department of every state. So if UNICEF certifies that this technology is the, is the best, then public health and engineering department or government of West Bengal will admit that is the best. So they have identified a couple of schools in the affected areas of, um, uh, of West Bengal. One of the uh, closest one is Rajarhat. Then I've in, you know, installed one, one, they have identified one more school in Malda, in uh, 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 North Malda. Then we deployed two, you know, uh, how, uh, filtration units for the arsenic removal thing. And uh, they were on deployment for six years. I gave number of presentations in front of the arsenic task force government of West Bengal. But when these filters were running for, you know, long period of time and they found the advantage of it and then they said uh, they gave a certificate that uh, uh, this is a feasible technology developed by Professor Dev, IIT Kharagpur. And then in 2014, it, the technology was transferred to a company and then till now this technology, Which company it is? this company was uh, Vazbros Private Limited. So, again the proprietor is basically an alumni of this institute mm -hmm. and he was based on Rachi Jharkhand. Okay. After that, couple of years, uh, Mandal Precision Private Limited, one more company is there. They have transferred this technology and commercialized. We set up the set up a you know 500 kg per day production unit plant at their location in uh, uh, Howrah. And uh, they were closely operated with public health and engineering department. Now these guys, they have really done the production and we already used to check the quality of the material time by time and uh, they have installed till now more than 250 filters different places of uh, 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 West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, Jharkhand each of having capacity 2 to 5 meter cube per hour running for you know uh, for 5 hours a day so and uh, all these plants the oldest plant is running for 6 years last 6 years without any maintenance and uh, um, uh, the, the, the how many such plants do you know? I mean, do yeah, you it's more than 250. More okay. than that, across West Bengal and Assam, uh, and uh, West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, Jharkhand. Some plants are there in UP. And uh, it, 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 now this technology is transferred to third company who are basically in the uh, deploying of uh, household units. So they have already deployed more than 100 household units in different uh, you know, village, rural areas because this particular filter is. One of the so these are all groundwater filtration. This is the groundwater filtration, and the uh, ars so let let me tell you the you know fundamentals of the arsenic. Why the arsenic is coming? Arsenic has become a very big issue nowadays. So arsenic is generally attached to the uh, as a com com composite with uh, um, compound with iron and aluminium. Those are occurring in the rocks. This is geogenic cause, and because of several. Because of several activities, one of the activities is the human activity and the animal activities. Where uh, if the animal waste is there, and they will uh, run through the you know uh, run of water, and when they face this arsenic iron and arsenic aluminium bonds, these bonds get broken up, and the arsenic get released and come to the groundwater. Another is the phosphate fertilizer. So the phosphate radical is one of the culprit. Whenever it so in the all the river basins, it is very fertile land and uh, the agricultural activities are pretty high so all the phosphate you know radicals when they come off with the uh, runoff water rain water etc and they f uh, run through the groundwater they whenever they face these arsenic iron and arsenic aluminium bonds again these bonds get uh, break open and the arsenic get released and therefore the arsenic comes to the groundwater now this is a <coughs> this is happening last million of years but this has become a very big issue nowadays because since 1980s the, there is a there is a climate change and the rains are depleting ev decreasing every year and the water table in the groundwater it's receding like anything so whatever the arsenic has been come out there they gets concentrated every year so we have found out from the same location the arsenic concentration was 200 microgram per liter and after five years it has become 700 microgram per liter and uh, the first arsenic has been detected in uh, in west bengal in back in 1982 WHO limit, safe limit is 10 microgram per liter. I think it was in South 24 Parvanas. Yeah, South 24 Parvanas. So WHO safe limit is 10 microgram per liter. 
now in many so it cases is 10 microgram per liter and now 700 something yeah microgram. yeah the in fact the plains of bangladesh is the, the, it is the worst affected in throughout the whole world some places it has gone up to 2500 microgram per liter so this is very bad situation and and, and because of this you know the because of this we, you know all the river basins like you know plains of you know all, all the way from punjab haryana across the ganges Brahmaputra, all the states have been adversely affected by the arsenic problem. We have started to look into this problem back in 2003 and we have identified the nature of the soil. This soil is basically alluvial soil in the fertile area. So where the arsenic problem is there mostly. But if you go to the South India, where the lateritic soil is there, there is no arsenic you know, infection, in contamination in the groundwater. So we have found out all the seven districts along the Ganges, starting from Malda, Murshidabad, Nadia, uh, some part of Bardwan, uh, North and South 24 Pargonas, Calcutta, outskirts of Calcutta, all these districts, seven districts have been adversely affected by the arsenic problem along the Ganges. Not these areas, Minnapur, Makura, Purulia, western part, of, south, southwestern part of West Bengal. So because the soil is lateritic soil, and this contains lots of iron and aluminium, that's why the, it's a red soil, red mud. So my is the soil in this area. It's having a natural capability for the removal of the arsenic. So you are using that. So we are basically Mother Nature has given us a natural protection. So we are, we don't have the arsenic contamination in the groundwater in our area. So now that project has been very very successful, and uh, uh, I am really satisfied. More than five lakhs people are getting arsenic free drinking water um, throughout the whole but India. Th that is not filter. that is not that's a very meager figure. Five lakh you said. Yeah. I black is a very meager figure. It's very meager figure, but every, every every year the number of filters are getting increased yeah. because every year if you see the Jaljiban mission, they give a funding to the uh, state uh, you know uh, state governments, and they get uh, you know install these filters. So last three years, but this still I understand around this at least fifty uh, uh, crores people are there. Yeah, yeah. so uh, so actually now if, during the Jaljiban mission, what they are doing, they are basically purifying the river water and uh, putting it in the public distribution, the pipelines. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Uh, so that's what they're doing. So, but, but there, oh, are, there are some remote places where yeah. this public distribution is not there. They are putting up this. this just plans. to tell you that you know, in the last episode, uh, I interviewed Ovijit, who, you know, yes, yes. who works with this water uh, preservation and uh, right. finding out the causes of water contaminants. So he told me actually, the surface water treatment also has its other flip side because right, right. there are many other organic pollutants uh, that again more dangerous and that is more difficult to you you will be yeah, knowing yeah, that yeah, yes, to yes, treat yes. so so they are coming and uh, their effect on our health is not yet you know fully understood, fully understood or fully exposed right but that's a warning and caution uh, yes. <laughs> we should have yeah. but the uh, government thrust is always to you know uh, do the treatment of the surface water right. and uh, put into the public distribution mm, so that's, that's why the you no know, distant remote pockets where there is no supply of the uh, pipe pipe uh, pipe pipe to water so there they put up these plants these treatment plants so now every year this fund comes from Jaljiban mission and they are going to put more than you know uh, 100 plants 50 plants at least and uh, our uh, this lateritic based technology has been uh, put in the government tender so is as a, as a one of the feasible so other than design. arsenic your yeah. technology what what other kind of pollutants it yes. can also treat so this particular uh, so any groundwater whenever you put a treatment you know, first thing you have to remove the iron remove removal otherwise the iron will choke the whole filter and the filter will stop wo working so this particular whole filter assembly remove iron arsenic as well as the bacteria and another uh, um, uh, water treatment technology I'd like to mention because you will see how the social stigma and taboo will change the direction of the research okay so we are basically looking for any natural media uh, for example our, for laterating media since it is naturally occurring its cost of production is less it is not a synthetic material it's not a chemically synthesis material so therefore so you are using clay basically it's what basically I using uh, natural rock natural rock uh, but uh, again uh, that would also cause environmental uh, some kind of no is there any kind of no, suppose there, it's a mining kind of thing no? it's are, mining but there are queries after queries available from this place to all chotanagpur plateau and uh, till middle of india you know mid plateau no, i i understand today still no you have certain resources but sometimes it will like, yes, yes. natural yes. means though, there yeah. would be always again you are putting something on nature right. anyway yeah, so right. today yeah. it, it, so it is a, it is a viable solution yes, the, yes. yes. Right. and then uh, th there is another problem See, is there is there any recycling process suppose no 
your filter yes. that that material can it be reused yes it is reused because okay. basically this is the, the moram and moram is used for the road laying purposes but not for filtration not for the no so basically so if it could, could have been recycled for filtration i think that no, would no, have it, been it, it cannot be recycled for the filtration because okay. after 5 or 6 years life will be over okay and it satisfies the tclp protocol what is this protocol if you just put it in the ordinary rainwater conditions or in adverse ph conditions the whatever arsenic is absorbed in the material it does not leach out it does not recontaminate water okay so it's a that, that that's how you, you need not to have a special way of disposing this material then uh, second thing is that we have found out the fluoride contamination in the groundwater in fact the fluoride contamination is much widespread in india compared to arsenic contamination uh, states like Hyderabad, uh, Telangana, um, uh, you know, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Haryana, Bihar, UP, five districts of West Bengal, Bakura, Purulia. In these districts, there is no arsenic problem, but there is tremendous fluoride uh, contamination in the groundwater. So, so, more or less 700 million people have been exposed to the fluoride problem. And what excess? So, fluoride is required for the human health to up to some extent up to a concentration of one milligram per liter it is good for our health because it it creates the enamel on the uh, there is a protective layer on the teeth now if excess fluoride the intake of the excess fluoride cause, causes uh, weakness in the bones so it, it causes you know early onset of osteoporosis the bones weakens and uh, whenever there is a certain you know pressure the bones get you know uh, cracked so it, it is the whole disease is called fluorosis. So uh, the the symptom is basically rickety bones, the bent uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know uh, the bent bones. Then there is a yellow layer formed on the teeth. So it's, it's a very pathetic condition. And there is absolutely no medicine. The medicine uh, this the whole uh, disease is called fluorosis, and arsenic causes arsenicosis. It's a skin cancer. There is no medicine of arsenicosis and fluorosis. You have to take the you know high protein diet. Doctors prescribe high protein diet, so have, you have to get the immunity power and the resistance, and you have to take the fluoride or arsenic-free drinking water and cooking water. So that is the only remedy. So we have started to look into the fluoride removal. Now this this particular lateritic material it does not remove fluoride because it contains uh, iron and aluminium hydroxide, which are the potent adsorbents for the arsenic, but not for the fluoride. So we have again started looking into the fluoride removal things and we have again started looking into the naturally occurring things. Then we have, so what fluoride, which material will, will remove fluoride? There are two materials, alumina and um, calcium. So we have started looking into the uh, bone mill, bone mill that is used for the uh, you know, fertilizers. Okay. So it, it is a rich source of calcium. So we made carbon out of it. Those are organic basically. Those are organic. Bone, mills are organic. bone mills are organic and it is a rich source of calcium. Calcium is already there in the bones. So we made a carbon out of it which is rich in calcium. And then we have done some chemical treatment. We have done a coating of aluminium so that its uh, fluoride removal capacity is increased several times. Then we started you know, using that material as a fluoride removal unit. So that's in the charcoal you are mixing it? Charcoal. So we are mixing charcoal with the uh, with, with aluminium so that it, it get, get, gets a coating of aluminium so the fluoride removal capacity increases because of the dual role of calcium and aluminium. So then we made some filters. In fact, we got a project from D DST also, but uh, they gave me a warning that time. We are approving the project, but it, it will be creating an ethical issue because you are using the Bone. bones, animal bones. So that may not be acceptable to all communities. Mm. But they said, okay, since there is not much uh, of the solution, you, you go ahead with this problem and they gave a funding and we developed the project and deployed the project. That is the taboo you are talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm talking about in the product. So we developed filters and deployed and then I, again I went to like Arsenic Task Force, there is a fluoride task force of the government of India. So I went there, gave a presentation. They said, Professor, they, so they know me about the arsenic thing, so I was, they were quite happy about it. So said, Professor, there is a very good technology, the performance is very good, but we cannot, but we cannot approve it because of the ethical issue and all this. So, so right now it is all, all, only in the laboratory. No, no, they just uh, listen to me. Then, then uh, so uh, three years research has already, it has gone waste. So I said my student, no, we have to think something else. This will not um, happen. I also, uh, you know, informed the Department of Science and Technology of, of uh, funders that this is financial. This is the hmm. uh, problem they are saying in the state government. So this cannot, this is not feasible. They said, okay, fine, no problem. Professor, they you start thinking something else. Mm. So then, we, what we did, we uh, started looking into the why, uh, how the arsenic, you know, fluoride occurs in, a, you know, it's get arrested in the uh, rock. 
So in the rock, like uh, iron, aluminum, etc., uh, calcium is already there. And fluoride, there is naturally occurring fluoride, it forms a complex with the calcium, it is called hydroxyapatite. Okay, so this hydroxyapatite phase in the rock, it's basically calcium phase that, that captures fluoride and over the period of years, they get released and come to the groundwater. That is the cause of uh, fluoride contamination, increase in the concentration of fluoride in the groundwater. So we analyze the hydroxyapatite phase. So it's basically a complex of calcium and we started to synthesize in the lab. We, de we developed the, so we synthesized that hydroxyapatite phase in the lab. But it's a natural, it is a nanoparticle, it's a nano sized uh, material. But these nano sized materials cannot be used in the filter media because it creates a huge pressure drop. The water will not flow. So okay. it creates a huge pressure drop. That's right. That is number one problem. Second problem is that nanoparticles will leach out, come out from the treated water. Come out with the treated water. You cannot, you know, just stop it. Mm -hmm. To stop it, you have to use a nanofiltration membrane to recover the nanomaterial and recycle back. But that will be expensive. That mm -hmm. is not a rural solution, low cost solution. Then what we did, we did a very clever thing. We took uh, commercial carbon, commercial charcoal. That is the origin is not animal, it is origin from the plant. Okay, commercial charcoal, but with a highly porous commercial charcoal, with a surface area around 700 meters square per gram. That means it's highly porous. And we created the, we developed the hydroxyapatite phase in situ in the uh, charcoal itself. Now, this particular carbon, commercial carbon, which will be having a granule size of 2 millimeter, 3 millimeter, highly porous, we developed this particular phase inside it. And then we did some aluminium treatment and you know we put all the chemicals required to produce that particular phase. Okay. Hydroxyapatite, calcium, calcium rich phase. Right, right. So now this hydroxyapatite phase, calcium rich hydroxyapatite phase is grown inside the pores of this commercial charcoal. Okay. And then we again reacted with aluminium, some of the things, because the beauty of aluminium, aluminium is, aluminium has valency 3. So it captures three fluoride atoms. Calcium captures two. Okay. So it, in, it increases its high, you know, fluoride removal capacity pretty high. Yeah. So now we have produced a material which is carbon based, charcoal based, but with, with the hydroxyapatite phase is present inside it. And this granular material um, uh, has a very high capacity, 100 milligram per gram. No granular material throughout the whole world uh, has been found out to that high capacity. Typically activated alumina, the granules, they have a capacity around 10 to 12 milligram per liter. We have 10 times capacity. Now that has that we have presented in front of the fluoride task, they are very happy. And now they have given uh, us certain locations in public health and engineering department. Uh, and then uh, this this has been again transferred to, technology has been transferred to this Mandal precision who, are, who have taken us the arsenic removal technology. And again, we set up a very big plant to produce this material. Now they are producing around 1000 kg per day of this material, fluoride removal materials, already this has happened only this year. And uh, um, uh, so this during this COVID period itself, COVID period itself, so very challenging. You very did challenging, uh, yes. Uh, now, before that, I got a uh, got a project from WTI. It's a center of excellence of water treatment technologies, including five uh, institutes, uh, IIT Guwahati, NIT Durgapur, IIT Kharagpur, Jadavpur University and IICT Hyderabad. So I got a funding with my hand, but during this COVID period, probably one and a half year, we couldn't do anything. But after that, again, we started so and we developed I mean, this. who is the hub of that uh, project? IIT Kharagpur. Oh, you are so, the hub. <laughs> I'm the leader yeah. and uh, all the money come, comes to me and then we disburse. Okay, five great, institutes. Great, great. And uh, so that that is one very you know success story, and I, that's why I said the social taboo and the government prerogative they have you know changed the direction of the research. Hmm. Now uh, this this technology has been uh, transferred. How how uh, viable it is economically? It is highly said. highly viable. Uh, you know, final cost of the uh, treated water is only two paisa per liter. And uh, 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 they have come up with. So it's basically complementary of arsenic problem because the fluoride region is different, different than arsenic. Yeah. So in that way also, uh, 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 this is a yes. uh, another beautiful solution. Yes, the, nat the nature of contamination is also different. Arsenic so and fluoride are completely so different. So this things. this will be more uh, applicable to our region. Yes, laterite based. Uh, laterite region, based. In fact, uh, they, they have already set up around uh, ten plants in different uh, areas of uh, Purulia. And only uh, we have found out we, we we had a visit. The life of this filter we have just calculated for one year after the media had to be changed, and uh, the total um, uh, water that should be extracted we have calculated we have designed it for around uh, um, uh, two meter cube per hour. So it will be running for so it should be around uh, uh, around eight to uh, 
eighty eight lakhs liter per year. Okay, and these filters, you know, whenever they are deployed in the remote village, so this place is comp is, is around one hundred fifty kilometers from Kharagpur. This is a very remote village, and the filter has been installed there. And the you know the village, you know, the kids they just open up the you know, valves, the fluoride that we have set, that they have increased the fluoride, they have started taking water, you know, you know, in buckets and buckets. And till now they have drawn 32,000, 32 lakhs of you know water out of this filter that we have calculated, four times its capacity. Still, it is working perfectly, all right. And uh, one of the in, we have deployed one of the. So uh, you do periodic check. We, we, I do periodic check because. Uh, how 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 frequently you do check? I, I used to send my students at least once a month. Oh, you send your students yeah. so uh, these five places. Yes, the five places they are clo closely located. Within within a this know, is under your project. That's why you are. It doing is not under my project, okay. but it is uh, uh, deployed through the uh, public health and engineering department fund by this uh, company because I cannot produce that much of material at a time. That's right. Yeah. So they they have commercialized, but I used to keep the monitoring because it is nearby. Yeah, and also your research. Uh, you know, yeah. So I we, we required that because uh, I'm going to present it in the Jal Shampad Mantra because in the Jal Shampad Mantra they give a you know approval. Arsenic thing they have approved already, so it is it is it is it is on their website. For the fluoride thing, I'm going to apply for for all these. I need all these data, supporting data. Yeah. Right. Okay. So another thing is that uh, in uh, Bagda area, in North 24 Parganas, we deployed in a particular village. They want they, they have the arsenic problem in the groundwater, so they asked us to um, uh, send some you know domestic filters. So from the project, I deployed around 20 such filters in the village, and. When this filter is there, after six or six or eight months, there is amphan, and there was no you know um, drinking water because all the pipelines have been gone, and uh, you know uh, pond water everything was contaminated, and the whole village was scattered from our twenty filters. So they gave they gave so a. So what was the source of water? No, they put the you know the flood water, water into that. Pond water. Put the put the pond water into so that. So that is drinkable. Drink, drinkable water. Okay. And we also checked it in our lab. So and mm. they after that they gave a you know sort of certificate writing that it was very handful to you know handed to mm. us with the with the signature of all the users in the village. So mm. that was very satisfying. Then uh, now let me come to some you know industrial um, uh, relevant uh, solution. I had a series of projects from Tata Steel. So. Um, uh, Tata Steel used to give me projects for the removal of the cyanide from the steel effluent, uh, steel plant effluent. Now, this this cyanide concentration can be as high as you know six to twenty milligram per liter, and uh, depends on different times of the season and the production, etc. The tolerable limit is 0.2 milligram per liter. So, what they do? They do they dilute the whole thing and they put in the Brahmani River. Oh, yeah. So that is the uh, typical thing. Now they are looking for the cyanide removal solution several you know years, and they finally landed up with me. That was the fourth project with them. So um, uh, I gave a very simple solution to, to them. So they have, they have just they uh, put the you know they have to bubble the water, and they put the hydrogen peroxide. The, and the ratio is four liter in hundred liter of waste. Four liter of hydrogen peroxide solution, forty percent solution in hundred liter of waste, and then you just uh, spark with air. So during the presence of air, the cyanide, say it completely, you know, mineralized, completely broken up into, you know, carbonate and nitrogen gas, nitrogen dioxide gas. So it, it gets removed, and bicarbonate is a, you know, harmless salt in the in the in every water it is there. And uh, you know, th this was a very challenging problem. It was a project of two years. We were unable to hit it, and then when the two months are left of the project, we ultimately got the solution. And uh, immediately they were very, you know, excited, and we put up a plant of five meter cube per hour capacity in uh, in Jamshedpur plant in Tata Steel location, Jamshedpur. So uh, they used to, and it was running for six months, and they checked all the parameters, everything. It was perfect, perfectly all right. After that, they have, uh, they, they have in the in the during in that time they have uh, you know taken over a steel plant from Bedan Group in Angul, Orissa. And they set up a 80 meter cube per hour plant based on technology. In presence of UV, that this hydrogen peroxide, um, uh, it, it is a photocatalytic re reaction, reaction in uh, uh, presence of UV light. Okay, so UV light gives the energy initiation, and the, uh, the and the, uh, there is a photocatalysis, and then it gets you know chain reaction form and it gets broken up. Now this 80 meter cube per hour plant was in operation 
and it was inaugurated only uh, uh, five months back and I was there in the uh, during that time and still now it is working very and you just imagine 80 meter cube per hour so it is a huge plant now they have they are so satisfied this particular person who was you know uh, contact person there he was the R&D chief now he has been he has been promoted based on this technology Tata still got several awards etc and it was only 14 lakhs project oh it is only 14 lakhs project for two years yeah yeah so now they are they are setting up one more plant in another location of 100 meter cube per hour capacity and they are giving consultancy to other uh, you know companies steel plants so that is one of the success stories in the wastewater another was you know uh, um, uh, this uh, rice mill effluent mm. yeah so this has been completely developed during the covid period this rice mill every you know a standard rice mill there are there are more than 1500 rice mill near badwan district near badwan and uh, uh, adjacent hugli there are more than 1500 rice mills are present there are various types of rice mills of different capacities each of rice mill they produces water you know means uh, you know, effluent water in the range of 10000 liter to 150000 liter so although they recycle for 3 to 4 days every week they lift from the groundwater to a tune of 150000 liter so 150000 groundwater in 150000 into 2 3 lakhs water is taken up from the ground, extracted from the ground by a rice mill. Oh. There are so many rice mills in West Bengal and other places. So you want recycling of that? Yes. And what they do, they just after two and three recycles, they just throw it away in the nearby canal and it contains high organic load and uh, it gives a very bad foul smile, uh, smell and uh, the whole uh, you know area it gets infertile and there is you know, uh, demonstration by the protest by the farmers, they block the highways. So that is a typical thing uh, near the rice mills. Okay. So pollution control board was, you know, uh, they, they, they tried various technologies, they failed. And ultimately, uh, they came to me and they said, Professor Day, if you, are, if you can look into this problem, we'll be very happy. In the meantime, I got the center of excellence project. I got enough fund. So I said, no problem. You need not to fund anything. I, I have fund. I will, will develop the technology. So again, I gave a very simple technology. The first thing we gave alarm treatment. During the alarm treatment, all the suspended solids they get precipitated. Rest of the organic alarm treatment is aluminium. Aluminium, the, the normal potash alum that is available in the market is very cheap, okay. cheap material. After that, whatever the left. So this this material is a very rich in organic. So after you know drying it up and pulverizing, you get a very fine powder, which is a very good organic fertilizer. Then uh, the rest of the material, the, the, organ, the liquor, which is lean in organics, we f send it to a manganese dioxide coated sand column. So during, in this column, they get completely, uh, you know, uh, you know, completely de uh, disintegrated, degraded. And then the final thing, we send it to a you know, series of carbon columns that gives a final polishing. And the final ground water, the treated water becomes absolutely, you know, this sparkling white. The feed was yellow. And there is no BOD, there is no COD, and the TDS is very less. And then they recycle it back for you know number of times, many number of times. And this whole plant has to be you know uh, backwashed, cleaned every 15 days. And the volume of water that is generated is very less. They can simply just uh, dump it there. And so at the same time, it gives a byproduct that organic fertilizer. So this plant we uh, put a on the when the lo lockdown started in 2020. I remember the date. It was 16th, uh, 16th of uh, uh, March. I think it's 16th of March. We uh, set up the plant there, and the, that day IIT was uh, was going yeah. to be shut down. Shut down. Then I, I told my uh, you know, security people, my students are already there. They will be coming. So don't create any problem. They said no, sir, no problem. So they came back. So I, that's why I remember the date. So from that on was still date. The, the, it, it is de the rice mill, it is called Srima rice mill in Arambag area, it was deployed there. The, the initial capacity was 10,000 litre per day. Then we, the, because of the you know, performance they requested us, we upgrade to 40,000 litre per day. And till date it is working like the, uh, the performance like the first day. It is very, very, very good. Then during the lockdown period, the technology was transferred to a company. Now they have already got order of around 10 such orders. And they're going to deploy big plants, one lakh, one lakh liter per day capacity, one lakh fifty thousand liter per day capacity. So that was a very good uh, technology. And then uh, the last thing I would like to talk about this hollow fiber membranes. So 
whenever, whenever we get the RO membranes, Kent RO, etc., these membranes are basically flat sheet membranes. These flat sheet membranes are wound around that central axis, so it becomes, uh, they call it spirally wound membrane module. So the problem in the spiral wound module is the whole module becomes very expensive because of the internal arrangements and things. So nowadays the hollow fibers are coming very important. These hollow fiber membranes are there fine, fine fibers. So how how thick is there? The the it is around 500 600 micron thickness. The internal diameter is around 600 micron. The outer diameter is 1200 microns. So 300 micron thickness. So total. So then uh, uh, this the the beauty of the hollow fibers is you can pack large number of hollow fibers in a big uh, you know tube. And the surface area will be getting very, very large. The surface area is pi dl. There is a surface area. If you pack n number of such fibers, n into pi dl will be the total number of total surface area you will be getting. That because is the, because you are getting channels between uh, those cylinders. Right. That's why. Yes. So no. it is not only the fiber; it is also channels between yes. those cylinders. No, it's basically a hollow fiber, hollow tube. Mm. And I will be sending the feed in in the lumen of the tube. Mm. The wall is fi uh, you know porous. Mm. That is basically acting like a filter. Okay. And through the walls, because of pressure, the water is coming out. Okay. So, hmm. pi dl is the surface area. Okay. So, if you pack n number of such, such fibers in a bigger tube, n, n into pi. pi dl will be the filtration area. So, you can attain a very large filtration area in a small, in a small volume. Okay. So, therefore, the size of the filter will be very, very compact. So, another uh, uh, beauty of the hollow fiber is, if you do a performance in a laboratory scale, the scaled up version, it will be the same. Okay. Simply because... But the material, is a polymer. But in your case, the material may be charcoal and others. So how are you going to? No, no. In my case, it is not. It is basically membrane material. Membrane. Material. Membrane material. Okay. So it is a membrane. It's a polymeric membrane. And uh, initially, we started this in back in 2010. We have seen the you know, advantage of the hollow fibers. Then hollow fiber spinning unit. I looked for whether it's commercially available or not. The first commercial unit that I came across, it is uh, in Netherlands, in 2013. That time, it was costing around 1.2 crores one unit so it's very expensive then we have started to think how to prepare it very low cost cost effective way that time then we did uh, we used two syringes or uh, disposable and the, the the main body is called spinneret through which the spinning is done the spinneret is very simple assemb assembly there are two needles one is bigger size one is a smaller size the smaller size needle is in the middle and the, through the annular surf, annular region the polymer is allowed to flow and the polymer solution is made in a solvent and water is an anti-solvent to the polymer. So whenever water comes in contact with the, uh, with the polymer, the, there is a phase change of polymer. Polymer gets solidified. It no longer becomes a solid, um, uh, you know, a liquid. It becomes a solid. It solidifies. So you will be getting a polymer thread with a hollow core inside and then you just wound in a spool. Do you collaborate? Because no, you are, I uh, see, you are doing so many different kinds of material. Do you, are you doing on your own or do you collaborate with you also with you know, other experts in those areas? Like you know, polymer, we have so many other experts for just polymer itself. No, no polymer, uh, it's basically chemical engineering thing. Okay. So I uh, polymer it's, thing. It's I regular thought, stuff. It is a regular stuff. Okay. And uh, other materials, I took help from the material science engineering department. So mm. they, they helped. Uh, then uh, this, this policy, so, so I, I created that machine. I developed that machine. It mm. costs around, uh, you know, uh, 2.5 lakhs. Right. So I brought down the cost from 1.2 crores to 2.5 lakhs. So it's a, say, manufacturing is also very complex, no? In your yes, case, manufacturing is very, very complex. So are you, are you taking our advanced manufacturing? No, no. So you are just doing we, simply we, by. We just design it, and there is a local fabricator. Huh. So he got it fabricated, and this spinner, the actual Japanese spinner, cost 80,000 US dollar that time. The first spinner I, 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 I prepared, it, it cost only 20 rupees. I used two disposable syringes. Oh, that's what you are saying, two disposable syringes yes, you are using. Yeah. Okay. So one is a larger size and one is a smaller size. So it's, a, it's a kind of your invention yeah, uh, yeah. for this kind of... Right. Uh, so then we, we, we prepared that spinneret. But that spinneret, mm, uh, it's for single use. Because one time you spin, the polymer gets solidified, it cannot be used for the second time. Mm. But that is for the, you know, but 20 minutes, it doesn't yeah. matter. So, but still it is, you know, not uh, you know, proper. So we developed a proper spinneret with the Teflon bush and the you know, stainless steel uh, you know, body. Another company contacted me, it's a medical company. Uh, it is called Forest Health. Forest Health located in Bangalore. They have a close tie with Narana Ridwala. They said, sir, since you are doing the hollow fiber members, why don't you make the, prepare the hollow fibers, hemodialysis hollow fibers. Okay, for dialysis. For the dialysis. For the hemodialysis, 
uh, these are hollow fibers. If you look into the hemodialysis cartridge, the cartridge contains lots of such fibers. You know, around 10,000 fibers are there so that the surface area becomes 1 meter square. N into pi DL should be 1 meter square. That is for the hemodial the total surface area required for a uh, you know adult patient having body weight beyond 60 kg. Now the hollow fibers we are we are talking about the water filtration and the hollow fibers for the hemodialysis uh, you know cartridge. There is a drastic difference. What is the difference? This type in this case in the hemodialysis the internal diameter should be in the range of 180 to 225 micron. Wall thickness should be between 35 to 45 micron. This is sacrosanct. If you produce, it's basically a ultra filtration range of fiber filter, but with that particular stringent uh, criteria of the dimensions. Why it is so? Because in a typical uh, cartridge, we, have, we are having around 7,500 fibers so that the surface area becomes one meter square. These are hair thin fibers. Oh, 200 micron internal diameter is hair thin fibers with a, with a core inside, hollow core and that to the wall thickness will be in that range. Now, if you really, the doctor said that whenever you will be passing uh, blood from the body into the hemodialysis cartridge, there will be a residual volume inside the cartridge. What is the residual volume? In one fiber, the volume, internal volume is pi d square by 4 into L. And if there are n, it will be multiplied by the n. Typically, this particular length is 18 centimeter. That is also sacrosanct because then it will be fitted into the hemodialysis machine. If you make a 10, 10, 10 centimeter long uh, cartridge, it will not be fitting in the hemodialysis machine. That is not acceptable. So, length, internal diameter, thickness, etc., all be set by the you know, doctors, uh, clinic, uh, clinicians. And then they said, doctor said, this the residual volume of the blood inside it should be 75 ml. Should not be more than 75 ml because if it is so. Then although they inject heparin, heparin is basically anticoagulant for the blood. The blood may coagulate inside and there is a blockage of the flow of blood. They will be built up on pressure in the uh, patient's body and he may get a cardiac it, arrest. It needs to be exactly 75 or it should No, it should be less than 75. Less than 75. The, the upper limit is 75. Upper limit is 75. Upper limit is 75. And the length is L. And typically they put 7500 to 8000 fibers so that the surface area becomes uh, you know, 1 meter square. Now, if you put n into pi d square by 4 into L is equal to 75 ml, L being 18 centimeter, n being 7500, D turns out to be 200 micron. So, that is the magic figure and that is a rational to have that, that trend 180 to 225 micron internal diameter. And the water Earlier it was 600 in your uh, that is the water figure. Was 600. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the, my spinner rate and spinning unit will be completely different in this mm. case. Okay. So now uh, the wall thickness is 35 to 40 microns, 45 microns. Why? Because if it is less, if the micron is a is a wall is thin, then because of fluctuation of the blood pressure in the body, uh, say let's say 150 millimeter mercury, there is two atmosphere, so the fibers may rupture open. So again, there will be an accident. And if the um, uh, thickness is more than 45 micron, then the permeation or the passage of urea in creatinine. Will be from the blood will be taking lots of time. Typically, the dialysis procedure takes three and a half hours for a patient. The doctors they don't want to keep it, you know, prolong it for further because that will create that, that may create additional problems. So, uh, so that is the rationale between 35 to 45 microns. So the dimensions are very very critical. So I didn't have that uh, spinner at that time. So then I again we started doing research and ultimately there was a I also had a very good student with me. Anirvan that type, so he was doing PhD and we kept on you know developing things and and then ultimately we found out the compo you know combination of the syringes that will give exactly that much di dimension of internal diameter and the wall thickness. Then uh, we did it with the artificial blood in the laboratory, it was working perfectly alright. In fact, uh, if you look into the hemodialysis cartridges. In India, we do not, we did not have any technology for spinning of the hemodialysis fibers. So, in fact, very few companies, it is a proprietary item of four companies throughout the whole world. Freshness is the market leader, it is a German company, followed by the, followed by Membrana and Baxter, they are US company and the two Asian companies, Nippur and Gambro, they are basically Jap Japanese and the Korean company, South Korean companies. These four companies, five companies, they have the whole monopoly throughout the whole world. They have the whole spinning unit for cartridge preparation, everything. Now, uh, the Fresnias cartridge, if you go to the open mar market, it costs around 2100 rupees. 
and the nipro camera they, co they cost around 1200 rupees it varies in that range depending on the country of the origin and the uh, this thing company now these hemodialysis cartridges are generally for used for meant for the single use but since uh, we are poor doctors use the uh, same cartridge three to four times for the same patient so every time they just uh, try to regenerate it with the solution and they use it but every regeneration causes a loss of efficiency to a tune of 30 percent that means if a patient is going to use the same cartridge for the second time he has to be exposed to a dialysis procedure 30 percent more time that is quite dangerous doctors they don't allow it so in that case he does not he is the urea creatinine level does not come to the desired level slightly low you know higher than that likewise it is going on for the usa and uh, european countries it is used for the single use and the after they, they they collect all the cartridges and they regenerate it and the used cartridges are used for the sub-saharan countries oh. so that is the scenario of this thing so now with uh, our you know low cost spinning etc the whole cartridge cost we have calculated it should be around 500 rupees or so it will be we can, we can bring it down to three times again uh, in the year of 2011 i got a project from uh, department of science and technology the, it is basically instrumentation development unit like WTI, there is an IDPP program, Instrumentation Development Program, IDP program. They gave me this project. So we developed this project that time, that period. Then they gave it for the, you know, uh, then the project has gone for the, you know, second phase, third phase. Now the fourth phase is going on. We are doing the um, uh, te animal testing. Now the, we, we are producing the fibers here. We are sending the, um, you know, bundle of fibers to a company in Chennai. It's called Spectra. They have the technology to pot it, they assemble it in the cartridge and then they test it to MVC, Madras Veterinary College, to use it on the diabetic dogs. Now the animal trials are going on and uh, we have got very encouraging results compared to the commercial cartridges. So uh, it, it's, it's great, I mean, uh, it's, it's another dimension of your research yes. outcome, what I could see. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, no, it's, it's great to know that no, you did so many different kinds of very useful applications yes, yes. and uh, uh, I should say that by listening to your story that no, your experience is Gail actually it's Gail. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a boon for us. <laughs> yeah, boon for us because no, you left and you again no, looked into the academics seriously and then now you are well yeah, uh, completely inside the industry. I don't have any other, any other work, I don't do any other work. I'll be completely doing all this, spending most of the time with the students. Right, right. and, and, you and know, also uh, with the industry also now you have so many industries with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah I, there are industries that lined up with me. I'm not taking projects in fact. Uh -huh. so, yeah, I understand. Yeah, no, yeah. You have your uh, own time, own engagement. So just tell me also the other part of the story that uh, it's very applied research what you told. But I understand that a lot of fundamental things you you also did yeah, yeah. and that ha you have applied. So yes. tell me a little bit of that about your membrane you know, separation is one yeah, of yeah, your yeah. Uh, right. ex expertise. So what are the fundamental things you, know, you found there and you know, that is also you are using here. Right. So. So every every study that will be that is scalable, there is a fundamentals behind it. So I cannot you know scale up a plant based on heuristics. There should be fundamental modeling, fundamental understanding based on that the modeling or designing should be done. So in in membrane the major problem is the pore size distribution, because membranes are of various size. If you look into the reverse osmosis membrane, we separate salts out of them. The pore size is two to ten angstrom. Another thing is then this nano filtration membrane. There we separate out divalent salts and dyes small molecular solutes up to 1000 mole Dalton molecular weight. So this pore size is between 2 to 10 angstrom. Then comes ultra filtration. It is from it is from 20 angstrom to 1000 angstrom. And there are various cutoffs of ultra filtration. Means uh, various pore size of different types of ultra filtration, grades of ultra filtration. They have the specific application. So fundamental understanding of various polymers, their interaction with solvents and how to do the you know spinning the exposure time different conditions like humidity etc humidity plays a very important role so uh, and uh, composition of temperature of the gelation bath so all these fundamental you know properties they control the pore size final product of the of the material that is the pore size of the membrane and because of the pore size the final application will be uh, basically targeted 
that is one thing that is very fun so we, we did lots of fundamental uh, thermodynamics of polymer and sol solvent thermodynamics different types of polymers different types of solvent what is the interaction uh, thermodynamics behind it so that it will be the phase separation will be um, uh, done properly so that i'll be getting a uniform distribution of the pore size that is one thing second is processing during the process the major problem is the uh, fouling of the membrane because of the fouling of because uh, in in a memory is nothing but a filtration okay and higher molecular solutes they get physically separated by the membrane we call it a, a sieving sieving action because of sieving action they form a layer over the membrane surface so this layer gives a resistance against the solvent flow and the throughput of the membrane becomes less so this is known as concentration polarization we did lots of modeling on on this particular thing and and various different membranes like ultra filtration membrane micro filtration membrane reverse osmosis and nano filtration they have different mechanisms of fouling so we did extensively on that study and uh, utilizes all these uh, you know expertise and modeling we did a, a proper scale up like uh, in the laboratory i probably preparing a membrane of surface area let's say uh, 100 cm square but in a scaled up version it, it requires you know 5 meters square 10 meters square 12 meters square so how to do the you know uh, so fouling study is very important because ultimately that dictates the life of the membrane at the end of particular performance you have to regenerate the membrane what is that time what is the frequency how long it will last so all these scaling up calculations will be coming from the fundamentals so uh, currently on, only last week we have done a technology transfer agreement with a company in new delhi who will be taking up the spinning technology so that is very very great thing and uh, another aspect that i have not touched upon i should i think i should tell the fruit juice clarification any fruit juice citrus fruit juice they contains lots of you know uh, protein and uh, you know bacteria etc and these proteins and bacteria they and pectin there is something called pectin pectin is a gelatinous material through which by separating pectin we can prepare jam and jelly so all the citrus juice they contain pectin and protein so this pectin and protein protein they interact and they are the potent source of bacterial growth so juice spoils if you just leave over the juice for 25 minutes it will be spoiled there is a bacterial growth there is a you know uh, sour taste will come and it will be completely gone so if we do a heat treatment it called a sterilization by the heat treatment you expose the juice to 120 degree centigrade for few seconds the bacteria is completely gone then do it in then you do aseptic packaging but because of the heat treatment the actual flavor taste, taste and taste all the nutritional qualities they are completely gone so that is that has a very you know currently that is used in most of the cases but its market uh, uh, review is not that good so there is a uh, there is a demand of market driven demand for naturally naturally occurring taste flavor nutritional quality etc to be in the juice which will be having a long shelf life so then we used a cold sterilization technique so this technique is nothing but membrane separation so we 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 use so in the uh, we are, first we analyze the juice what is there in most of the juice even in tender coconut water there is a uh, something called poly uh, polyphenol peroxidase it is an enzyme this enzyme co causes it spoils the juice and it co it causes browning of the juice there is a bacterial growth so you filter out that and it has a molecular weight around 45000 dalton so we developed a membrane tailor made a membrane so that the pore size becomes you know such that it will be completely removed so by that we remove bacteria the but will will it not also you no know, you are not are you not losing something also because no, it, it is it, going it, natural things yes. so basically we are using ultra filtration membrane higher pore size membrane that will remove all the undesirable things but all the nutritional things like sugar citric acid vitamin c and uh, like polyphenols they are having molecular between uh, around around 100 200 300 300 and they are they, and these particular membranes are meant for separating of solutes having molecular more than 40000 so they will be coming out with the filtrate with all the nutritional quality intact nature and the taste also taste intact. and flavor this the components causing for the taste and flavor they are also very small molecular it they will be coming completely there and sugar content tss so, that also so it is nutritious and also it remains yeah, yeah, right. keeps the taste then you do aseptic packaging here i i uh, collaborate with professor hn mishra of uh, agriculture engineering department and we developed technology for the sugar cane juice okay and uh, there are at least several companies they have uh, they are coming to visit and all this so i am going to put a demonstration for three of them uh, and if it gets technology is transfer then is fine and uh, another thing is tender coconut water that i also we have done and it has a we have found out it has a shelf life for four months okay 
16 weeks, 4 months. And this sugar cane juice, it has a shelf life of 90 days. So, we will be having different kinds of now juices yeah, yeah, in the market. Yeah, right. So, it, if it is uh, successfully you know, scaled up and commercialized. Scaled up and commercialized. Yeah. So these are the rough profile right, of different right, various right. aspects of my research. So, so during this COVID time, that's this two and a half years almost now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how could you work? Because no, you require so much of laboratory work. Yeah. So uh, that's true. In fact, first one year we could not do any laboratory work. Uh, first one year, but uh, if you if you remember, the PhD students were allowed for five first six months or seven months. So during that time, uh, the students who were on the you know verge campus. of completion in the campus. We, we did the paperwork and uh, by that time we uh, lots done lots of theoretical works also that time and once the, the, the it was slightly relaxed the PDF students and the PhD students were allowed we have, they have started coming to the lab and they have started doing works so the later of the COVID work we just uh, you know so how does it affect it do you see that I, I could see that you had you have done so many good works, but do you think that no, you could have done more? Yes, you could have done more. I mean, of the it, it has made certain schedule a yeah, little yeah, yeah, yeah. affected. That, that is true. The work, work has been affected a lot during COVID period, but ultimately we used to manage. Hmm. Okay, so we, I, I, I took special permission from the registrar hmm. at that time to you know, allow the PDF students. So system supports, so I mean, system, whenever system because they know that no, you are yes. doing uh, very in, good work. And, uh, in fact, uh, I got a permission from Dean also, R&D, that uh, I am having so many projects, so I allow this person, that person. So they are kind enough to allow that. So right. somehow we managed to work, work was continuing. So, yeah, we it's a kind of working. pragmatic approach hmm. to handle epidemic and also, yeah. you know, and uh, also continuing our good yes. work. So, yeah. in fact, if you if you do lots of industrial project and uh, you know projects like, like UNICEF, mm. they are always you have to always at the toes. Mm. So, basically, the industry they are uh, you know giving projects from their own pocket. Mm. So, it is not the public fund organization. So, so basically, you have to be on your toes. And once you deliver, it, then only the then only the, the next next, next, next phase will come and, phase and will you come. have the good reputation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I get a series of projects from Tata Steel. Currently, I'm getting the Punjab refinery, GGS in refinery. I'm getting another project. Uh, I, I got you know several projects from a private company in Bokaro, Bokaro Steel City. So there are several industrial projects I'm having, and uh, and these projects are very of small duration because industry does not have any patience. DST project they can wait for three years, they can wait for five years. No. Industry doesn't but have any patience. But how do you manage? Because no, I, I I could see the difficulty. You the engaging manpower is itself is a yes. big problem. So how do you solve that? Yes, I have a big you know group of the students, and uh, uh, it is a God's grace that they are very good students, and uh, they used to go to different locations, install the plants. If there is any problem, they analyze, come back. So I got I got a very good support from the students, PhD students, PDF students. They are they are gems. Gems of the boys and girls, and uh, I'm really happy with them. And uh, most of them are now become faculty of different IITs, NITs, and uh, some of the work cultures developed in the lab. Only the serious students they used to opt for me, <laughs> opt me as a supervisor. And once they come into the, the, the lab, within a couple of months, they get tuned to the culture. Lab of culture. The lab. Yes. Great. And yeah. I, I also support them like anything. Means uh, if some st students, you know, he is not getting any, he has submitted the PhD thesis, he is not getting any scholarship. Uh, I, I give support from the project. project. So uh, he is there for another five months, six months till yeah. he gets something. I completely sure. support them. And similarly, the students who are uh, work apart from their PhD work, they are they are doing here in the different projects. I give them honorarium. And uh, I really, you know, um, uh, praise the IIT system in the R and D. At least they have the system of honorarium, paying honorarium to the existing students who are getting scholarship. Mm. So that helps them a lot. It gives them motivation. And uh, they also see that I'm also with the work all the time, so so they get motivated by you. Motivated also. <laughs> so uh, uh, so that motivation comes. So who who are the influential persons in your life? I, I mean, you can of course parents. Yes. I, I know that. Yeah. So uh, you can tell about your parents how yeah. they influenced you and also others. My father was a headmaster. So we were we were all th we were three brothers, and uh, we had been you know brought up with a very disciplined regimen. So from our childhood, and uh, uh, my 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 elder brother was a was a brilliant scholar. So so they they so I, whenever I said my 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 elder brother was doing so good, so I also thought that I should do good. Uh, Dipend was very good. So he was I will I'll tell you he was uh, he got eleventh through the West Bengal in uh, uh, he was seventh in class tenth, 
फोर्थ इन क्लास ट्वेल्थ फोर्थ इन अल इंडिया आई एस आई हंड्रेड फिफ्टी सिक्स इन आई आई टी एंट्रेंस थर्टीन इन वेस्ट बेंगल जे एंड अल्टिमेटली जॉन्ड आई आई टी खड़गपुर एगेंस्ट इज उल ही वॉन्टेड टू डू फिजिक्स इन प्रेसिडेंसी कॉलेज now he has uh, he has you know he he has left his job yeah. over 25 years he has traveled throughout the whole world changed probably 40 you know companies yeah. after that he said enough is enough i have enough money so no problem he is just uh, staying at calcutta oh you know giving to the you know small student yeah, small he is our alumnus so you should yeah, yeah. reach out to him <laughs> to do something yeah. for the institute yeah. Okay, so uh, right, so, so, so your 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 so, so uh, environment during yeah. my uh, you know when I was kid, and then when I went to IIT Kanpur, the Kanpur culture was completely different. I was ten years at IIT Kanpur. The research culture was so competitive, so conducive. The teachers were stalwarts. Every discipline that the, the teachers were stalwarts. They were our role models in front of us, and uh, um, so we got motivated there itself. And the whole culture is so good. that uh, all the times we are talking about this that and there is no distraction that time also no that there is no mobile there is no really there wasn't tv that time so and only one channel so uh, and and i i and i used to think that uh, since my father was not there that time my brothers they used, they used to fund my you know uh, uh, during my days at iit kanpur so i thought since i came my my friends and my brothers they have sent me to such a long distance from calcutta to kanpur i should not waste time and uh, you know properly utilize so that was my idea so uh, although i i was involved in different art, uh, other activities in the hostels like sports etc but my main motivation was in studies only so um, uh, my teachers apart from the parents my teachers were a very great great influ- influence in my in shaping up my academic career teachers in school Did not, no, not teachers in IIT. Teachers in schools are very good, but I, IIT Kanpur, yes, mainly IIT Kanpur. So I had teachers like uh, Professor Y V C Rao. He was taller in thermodynamics. Then uh, uh, Professor Santosh Kumar Gupta. He was taller in control, process control and uh, optimization. Professor Anil Kumar. He was taller in polymer processing. And then uh, 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 Professor D P Rao, mass transfer operations. Professor R P Chhabra in uh, uh, transport theorem. So. my professor pushpa one of in, in mathematics so they are like stalwarts so they are basically builders of chemical engineering in india that time so they are my role models and i had you know very good you know relations with them till now so in regular intervals they used to contact me i used to contact them uh, get their blessings suggestions in different activities so they are a very very big motivation so h- how do you find this uh, iit kharagpur because you no know, one of your motivation was to be near home Yeah, and yeah, our yeah. institute benefited by yeah, yeah. that because fact. at that time but now then no, you have done so excellent work and uh, you are doing such great work uh, continuing yeah. your yeah so uh, iit kharagpur so when i was looking for jobs near our home i was very you know grateful to iit kharagpur they offered me a job and uh, that time i used to every weekend i used to go home because my mother was staying alone so i used to go home so uh, take take her to the doctor medicine etc etc often or she used to come to our campus but uh, all the doctors medicine etc everything was located at calcutta so most of the time she was there and in 2006 she expired and uh, after that uh, the, so so iit kharagpur gave me an opportunity that time to join here and uh, be close to home that was very uh, you know beneficial to me and then uh, but iit kharagpur did not look at that part i mean he they looked at your expertise no, that, and they did offer that's <laughs> but, but from my personal thing yeah, it was that's a, okay. i was very happy and satisfied that time suppose i used to be at you know south india or right. in delhi that time so i used to so that was a problem hmm. so and uh, during that time uh, uh, the i i uh, within within a within couple of years i got the lab, lab space in the department I started getting the you know projects, small small projects initially, and started build up my labs. And the best thing at IIT Kharagpur is that at any IIT system probably that you are your own boss. No one is going to influence you. So in your research, you have probably 120 percent independence. You can utilize to the fullest if you want. So the profile of the students here, they are far above that the creamy layers of the uh, of their of their com- you know compatriots in in the country. So they are very good, very efficient. so they have helped me a lot in building my career so because more, lo, lo, lots of theoretical works they have done by themselves even in the uh, in the laboratory works they really uh, you know they did wonderful works the student in a cross section of the students 
the IIT environment is definitely better than any other uh, institutes. But still, there is a scope of improvement. Every IIT, there is a scope of improvement. Uh, you, uh, particularly, let me tell you that now, uh, Kharagpur is a bit in the rural setup. Yes. Even Kanpur is uh, near uh, no uh, metro. Uh, the you are born, uh, you are born and brought up in Calcutta. So, don't you miss the, that life, metro life here? No, no, I don't miss that because uh, <laughs> you are so much engrossed <laughs> in your work. Yes, I, I so, so that is in a way a good because you don't have any distraction. Yeah. John, I'd <laughs> like to tell you one more thing. Uh, I had two kids. The elder one is a medical doctor in Apollo Hospital, Delhi. The younger one is uh, he's in class 12. Okay, he's so they studied in campus. He's, both of them studied in campus. Okay. Uh, I used to teach them physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology. The, none of the both of these kids they have never gone to any any other person to get tuition. I told them you go there, you go here. Oh, no, Baba, I'll, 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 you teach me, teach us. So that helped me a lot. You know the. Fundamentals, the 10 plus 2 fundamentals of mathematics and physics, when you just brush up, that give you lots of idea and that really helps you. And I found it really helpful and I enjoy teaching them. So, so since you have uh, talked about your family, so you can tell something more? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, my, my wife is uh, here, she, she is a housewife, but I should say that she has taken full responsibility to run the family. So she for the for the marketing everything. So uh, I don't look after much in those things like uh, you know management of the banks, management in the market etc. So everything the daily course is generally managed by the, my wife. She is a beautiful lady, always helpful, encouraging, and the kids are you know uh, really good. The first one is really is settled. I'm I'm very very happy, and the second one is looking for opportunities. He'll be getting something very soon. So, so you tell what he is doing now. My, my elder son is no, now medical, Apple oil. Apple yes, oil. Yes, yes. and my younger one he has given the 10th st 12th standard okay uh, he has he is just sitting in different um, you know competitive examination he is also inclined not in engineering but in medical like his uh, okay. uh, brother respiration so, is medicine yeah. right. so that way it's fine yeah, yeah. so so uh, thanks shishindu i mean best wishes for your younger son who is just looking for you know new life yeah. new you know academic uh, institutions and that. Uh, just now we are coming to the end of this program. So if you have any special message to our uh, young researcher and students uh, as a from the Professor Shishindu Day. Yes. So, uh, so I would like to convey that to be successful researcher, uh, hard work is very, very required. So if you if you aim something, 80% can be achieved by the intelligence only, but rest 20% you have to put really hard work. So there is absolutely no alternative of hard work. So hard working, sincerity, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you should be totally dedicated to the to, to your work. Then only the success will come. If you are half-hearted, uh, either in teaching or in research, you should be you should be you should be giving your full effort, fullest effort. And if you want to be successful, at least that I have found out that if I really, you know, look into a problem. And since I am looking practical problems, there are n number of problems coming up. Whenever you implement something in the laboratory scale, and whenever you are just installing in a plant scale, there are thousands of problems will be upcoming, and you have to solve each and every problem very meticulously. So sincerity, dedication, uh, these are essential qualities. And then you should be very, very thorough, and uh, you should be very honest. Like I know in many labs they do not report the actual data, so that that honesty should be. Imbibe but in the, actual life, when you are implementing, no, <laughs> that won't work. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So, so whenever um, I used to get data from my students uh, initially, I used to teach them, okay, repeat it once, repeat it twice. Sometimes they get bored, they get irritated. But after, you know, one year or so, they already repeat four times, five times, then they report the data to me. So, honesty is very, very, very required. Because if I, if I claim that my material capacity is 100 milligram per gram, it can, you should be ready to get it tested by any independent lab. In fact, all these filters they have been deployed in various parts of West Bengal. The the company they have deployed it, they, they, they should give a performance guarantee. They get part payments against performance guarantee every three months or four months. That means every three months the public health and engineering department laboratories they take the samples, analyze the data, and see if they are correct, then they get the next installment. So all the uh, you know uh, installations that I have done, the performance is tested by the third party. So that much confidence you should have that whatever you are doing you are, it should be very correct and you should be completely ensure that it is really happening 
So, and one more thing is that to do a good research, it need not to be a groundbreaking research. You can improvise the existing technology so that it can be affordable to a you know much lower cost to a marginal person you know residing in a remote village. And then there is the success of the technology. So, thanks, Shushendu. Uh, it was really engrossing talking with you. Wish you all the best and looking forward more from you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.